Candace. And I'm Ripley. And this is Com Explaining. The show where I'm never going to beat my juggernaut pun, so why even try? <laughs> hey, X-Men's now on sale monthly. Ooh. Up here on the title. That's exciting. Anyway, this week we're going to be in for another staple of the X-Men comics being introduced, and that's going to be the Sentinels. Not really a spoiler, they're right on the cover, reading Among Us Stalk the Sentinels. Yeah, I did notice that. <laughs> You picked up on the Sentinels, did you? I did. You could say I'm quite perceptive. (laughs) Was that supposed to be a joke or something? Because I'm really not following. (laughs) Yes, that was a joke. Don't get it. I don't get the joke. You're mean to me. You tell bad jokes. (laughs) You're so mean. (laughs) So we're going to start in on these semi-familiar faces with X-Men number 14 from September of 1965, written by Stan Lee. Art by Jack Kirby and Werner Roth, who also in the issue is credited by Jay Gavin. Not sure what's up with that. Apparently, Jay Gavin is Werner Roth. Inks by Vincent Coletta and letters by Sam Rosen, according to CMRO, but not according to Inside the Issue, so Artie Simak. We open on the X-Men undergoing medical treatment and physical therapy after their encounter with the Juggernaut. There's this weird implication that their powers are damaged that I don't quite get. I mean, the Juggernaut just beat their asses. He didn't do anything to Bobby's ability to make ice. Don't know what's up with that, but go off, I guess. You'll be relieved to learn that Scott's Opta-Ray force is almost back to normal. His what? (laughs) I don't know what that means. I've never heard that term before or since. Hmm. But it's back to normal. Well, that's good, I think. I'm glad for him. In fact, the professor deems that they have all suitably recovered, and so he immediately has Hank begin jumping about rather than easing on in. That's a great way to get muscle cramps, strains, and pulls trying to do too much too soon. I suppose it depends on how long they've been on bed rest. Hank declares that he can lick his weight in Neanderthals. Only if you get consent. This may just be a thing with him. Remember his encounter with Kesar? <laughs> Yes, I do remember. (laughs) How could I ever forget? (laughs) Oh, oh, indeed. Charleston declares that now that they've recovered, his X-Men have earned themselves a vacation. And they're all rather excited about that. However, elsewhere, a press conference is going on that's going to change the course of things to come for these kids pretty much forever. I mean, spoiler, the vacation isn't going to go well. That's really sad. I was really hoping for a beach episode. Not yet. Oh. There are beach episodes to come. (laughs) Well, thank goodness. It's going to be a while, though, unfortunately. Dr. Boulevard Trask of the PhD sort, not the MD sort, he's an anthropologist, is announcing his concern that the greatest hidden threat to humanity is the slowly growing population of mutants. The assembled press decides that the ravings of a bigot are actual news, and not just that, front page news and they quickly rush off to publish Dr. Trask's declaration. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You don't say. This is also kind of the beginning of how we've seen little bits and pieces of the public not being totally cool with the mutants, but this is the beginning of when it really starts. We really start this kicking in. But we don't stay with Dr. Trask for long. We instead turn to another instance of the X-Men preparing for their free time. And as seems to be an odd trend, we get some text that there's a whole lot to read into if you read Warren as trans, like I do. The whole conversation of, how do you stand it, Warren? It must feel like wearing a girdle regarding having something bound around his chest. And his response pretty much that it's worth it for him. I don't understand quite how he's binding his wings because that seems extremely painful. Yeah, wings don't really work like that, especially the top part that just folds Fold down over. over his shoulder. I don't know what's I was, up with that. I was just looking at that and being like, is it made of paper? <laughs> like, what's the deal? That's there a are bones great in there. fucking question. <laughs> and I don't have an answer. Also, Warren's parents don't know about his wings, and he kept them hidden under his uniform and couldn't afford to face a physical exam, so there's a lot to read into that through this particular lens. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
But then we pivot to others with a whole lot less to say. Scott has lovely long eyelashes, and that's about that. <laughs> Most of his thing is everything we know. I can't stand it. If I open my eyes, I will blast things. Yes, Scott, we know you talk about it constantly. We also turn to Hank. There are some things to say there. Beast has a frankly bizarre pair of shoes that I don't understand at all. They have a hinge at the toes that can open and close. And I'm not really sure what advantage that grants him because it's not like they hinge at the sole too so he could wrap his toesies around stuff and hang from things. They're just... Broken shoes? <laughs> Open-toed dress shoes, I guess. Open-toed loafers. <laughs> also, Hank wears his shoes without socks, which is gross. Ew. And with that, we also get another entry in the Scott, Jean, Warren love triangle. I think you mean the Scott Gene Warren OT3. Look, I'm not going to argue it. I've shipped it for years. <laughs> <laughs> so Warren offers to give Gene a ride to the train right before Scott had planned to. And after saying their goodbyes, the pair drive off with an oblivious Warren wondering if Scott likes Gene by the way he looked at her. I don't know if <laughs> Warren loves Scott or if Warren is just amazingly oblivious to the world around him. Both. You know, true and valid. <laughs> you pick up quick. I do. <laughs> also, I skimmed over the Scott asking the professor if he was going home, which is a bizarre question. This is like the opposite of the teacher lives in the school phenomena. Maybe it's an overcorrection after that incident with the juggernaut. Wait, my teacher exists outside the context of being my teacher? Gee, maybe he doesn't live here at all. Yeah, he converted his house into the school, right? Right, and he is effectively Scott's guardian. Yeah. This is a bizarre question. Hank and Bobby offer Scott the opportunity to come along with them on vacation, but Scott declines, off to spend time doing God knows what alone. Being sad and sulking, probably. You have friends, Scott. They love you. Charles Xavier also watches Scott sadly walk away. But I guess you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Clearly. Finally, with some peace and goddamn quiet and no fucking teenagers <laughs> in his house, Charles <laughs> settles in with his newspaper. However, he can't enjoy his vacation like he'd hoped, because on the front page of the paper is the report on Dr. Trask's declaration, irresponsibly working people up into a bigoted froth. Trask tells a story of mutants with their superior abilities taking over the planet and enslaving humankind. Xavier sees the panic that this could create and quickly wants to set another narrative for people to grab onto. Wait, I'm sorry. This is the news. Yes. But literally he was just like, hey, wouldn't it be fucked up? If two guys were on the moon and one of them was a mutant and he killed the other one with a rock, wouldn't that be fucked up? It'd be super fucked up because the other guy wouldn't stand a chance. Exactly. That's like literally exactly what he's doing here. Like, excuse you. Real question about these journalists, yeah. <laughs> Journalistic integrity going on here. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so in a big example of how money talks, Charles is able to get directly into touch with the programming director of National Television Network. And he urges the director to arrange a televised debate between Trask and himself. I thought we were keeping his identity a secret. I guess he is still a... I think he's still a noteworthy authority on genealogy, but that also has some problems later on, as in within this page. Oh, I can't wait. Within one night, they managed to arrange this debate, pushing everything else out of the way and getting these two next to one another on a desk. One night, Charles was given the go-ahead to start, and around the country, people watch as Charles declares that mutants are merely people, unable to help the abilities that they're born into, and that no one even knows what causes these mutations. Now that has some problems with some future canon, in which one of the things he's known for is his research on the X gene. You don't know what causes these mutations, Chuck? You have no idea? You? You don't know? Well, maybe that's just what he wants to people say. to think. Yeah. You know, that's a decent point. Now you mention it. He's just sitting here managing his image. Yeah. Don't want anybody to think that he's the leader of the X-Men. He is very protective over that idea, so that's 
actually a fair point. Well, yeah, if they suspect that he's the ringleader of the mutants, then they'll understand that he's the one who's going to kill them with a rock on the moon. <laughs> right. They'll also know where to send their pitchfork-wielding mob. Yes. Call up the operator. Hello? What's the address? <laughs> What's the address for X-Mansion? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> So this receives a mixed reception across the country, but then the spotlight is handed over to Dr. Trask. And rather than argue with Charles, Trask instead debuts his new sentinels that he has created. Another baffling example of scientists are scientists of everything, especially given he's not even a scientist in one of the hard sciences. He's an anthropologist. How the fuck did he engineer an army of giant robots? Yeah... I don't even have anything to say on that. It just pains me. (laughs) I'd say that's arguably worse than a doctor just randomly building robots. Not by too much, but it's worse. Yeah, I mean, with Donald Blake building his android, they at least had the justification, I say with air quotes, of him being an expert on human biology, and he made the android, like, synthetic human whatever. But this dude is a fucking anthropologist. (laughs) He's a social scientist. Jesus Christ. (laughs) But I digress. So Trask uses Charles Xavier as an example, showing how if he were a mutant, The Sentinels would be able to take him into custody and prevent him from using his powers, not knowing that this is precisely the case, as Charles tries and cannot use his abilities against the mechanical brain, which is a change from that issue of Fantastic Four with the awesome android, but not an unwelcome one. We'll get back to that. I think it's kind of rude how this robot's hauling him up out of his chair by the shoulders. I mean, he can't exactly get his feet underneath him. Leave him be. I was literally just thinking that. He ain't going anywhere. You're literally using a robot to assault this disabled man. Like, you didn't even ask him first. This is your public relations move, is that you're going to agree to have a debate, not debate, and instead assault a disabled man on national television. Yeah, this is like, this is a fucking, like, a scientific debate. (laughs) Not a floor for you to be like, hey, look at this stuff I made. Isn't it neat? He then brings forth even more of his sentinels to present to the American public, wanting to demonstrate their abilities. However, this doesn't quite go to plan. See, the sentinels are not as obedient as Trask had hoped. With their superior brains, they quickly go full sci-fi robot horror movie and declare that their big brains make them better able to think and they should be the ones in charge. So they knock Trask unconscious, and Charles reaches out mentally to the X-Men and bring them abreast of the situation. I do at least like that it's noted that this is at least partially because Trask is not an engineer, and that caused him to build a bad robo-brain. I guess some people just can't work in fields vastly out of their field of expertise. Some people. When Bobby and Hank receive the professor's mental SOS, they're at their favorite coffee shop, the Coffee A Go Go, watching Bernard perform his poetry again. You can just hear Stan dang dirty beatniks with their bad poetry and their bongos. Old man shaking fist at the sky. Bobby, in fact, tries to ask their waitress out on a date later. Don't creep on your service industry, people, folks. It's rude because they have to be nice to you. Well, she says... I wouldn't go out with you again if it was a tropical monsoon. So, like, she went out with him before. No, 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 no. See, she agrees to go, and then Bobby immediately cancels on her after Uh receiving the professor's SOS. Okay. Which I also don't get why she's so offended about it. It's like, it's like he didn't make plan Z. He just remembered that he had something to do, like, girl, chill. Right? You weren't going to go out right this second. You're at work. (laughs) So the boys rush off and they quickly change into their uniforms in a nearby alley before heading off on an ice slide to the professor's rescue. Uniform as if Bobby doesn't just take everything off and get in his boxers. (laughs) They put on their uniform, meaning they take off all their clothes because they're wearing it underneath their clothes anyway. (laughs) Yeah. You guys are on vacation. Why are you wearing your fucking costume? That's a great question. (laughs) Maybe they're going to go egg someone's house. (laughs) 
That's not a good look for the X-Men. No, it isn't. Those mutant menaces with their eggs and their toilet paper. (laughs) (laughs) So Warren Worthington is dining with his parents and he also receives the call and is forced to immediately excuse himself to fly off to the rescue. Back at the TV studio, all but one of the Sentinels leaves, and they're carrying Bolivar Trask, and their plan is to force him to teach them how to create more Sentinels so they can be numerous enough to protect humanity by ruling them. Charles does his best to keep the rest of the group at the studio sedate, but the strain is too much, and one man breaks free, dashing away to what he hopes will be safety, but the remaining Sentinel left on guard duty blasts in his direction. He's only saved from his fate by a mental force bolt staggering him. Before the Sentinel gets an opportunity to fire again, Iceman and Beast burst through the door, ready to throw down with the big nasty. Beast is having no luck. Nothing he can do is really capable of stopping the Sentinel, but Iceman does a little bit better, going for the old ice underfoot trick to knock him off balance, to great success. Charles begins to explain the situation to the two boys, but mid-explanation, the Sentinel fires off a heat ray at Bobby, and we're left in suspense as to the results, because instead we turn to another one of our teenage heroes rushing to the scene, albeit in a taxi cab. Scott urges the driver to make haste through the busy streets of New York, and by all means he seems to be listening, as a particularly sharp turn knocks Scott's glasses askew, and he blasts a hole through the roof of the cab. The cabbie pulls over and he puts two and two together before quickly riling a mob to chase Cyclops through the streets. Scott makes his getaway and begins changing into his costume even as he's running towards the source of the professor's distress call. I think it's particularly impressive that he's managing to do this while climbing stairs. I mean, it shows him taking his jacket off. I would have liked to have seen him taking his pants off on the go. Yeah, no kidding. Maybe that would almost be easier on stairs, though, because you're already lifting your leg. And then it gets stuck around your ankle, and then you trip <laughs> and fall, and you fall up all the way back down the stairs. And then you knock your glasses off your face again, and then the angry mob is back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he bursts onto the scene and quickly directs Beast to work along with him in a combo attack. However, the Sentinel is enough to hold off the pair of them, and Hank knocks himself out. With Cyclops' optic blasts exhausted and his friends down for the count, it seems there's nothing to do as the Sentinel closes in, and then freezes up and keels over. Finally, it would seem that the fight is over, and the X-Men clear the TV studio to take a better look at their opponent. Still attempting to answer the Professor's distress call, Angel encounters Trask and the rest of the Sentinels, and we learn that they can also detect mutants. And it makes you wonder why they didn't comment on Xavier actually being a mutant rather than being a pretend mutant on national television. Yes. But I suppose that doesn't actually matter. What matters here and now is Angel is juking and dodging out of the way of attacks from the Sentinels. Their zit beams. He evades their zit beams because nothing is going to be worse for his ego as a teenage boy. (laughs) Yeah. You get hit with the zip beams and then you're all broken out. That's true. It's fucking awful. He's trying to get away and something yanks him down towards the ground. And the Sentinels finally give up chase and we find out just what happened. It was Jean who kind of yoinks him out of a ridge with her telekinesis to the train that she's riding in down below. The Sentinels take off and Marvel Girl emerges from the train to join her friend in One of the most sensational demonstrations of telekinetic prowess ever recorded, Jean levitates herself up onto the roof. (laughs) Wow! I'm amazed. (laughs) Still, it's something she was previously unable to do, so it's kind of exciting. Yeah, it is. So the rest of the X-Men examine the fallen Sentinel. Charles heard it mutter something like Master Mold, but they're at a loss to just what a Master Mold could be. I would like to know why we didn't hear it mutter something like Master Mold. But, doesn't matter. Move along. So in an annoying reversal, Charles can indeed sense certain images from the Sentinel's mechanical mind, and can even sense their origin. This is really annoying to me, considering that he couldn't earlier. Earlier in this very comic. Right. I didn't like that he was able to strike the awesome android down with a mental bolt, but I could deal with it. I hate that he couldn't affect the Sentinels earlier in this issue, but now can. Like, fucking pick. 
Angel and Marvel Girl rejoin the group just in time for an explanation and the plan to head to the Sentinels' headquarters to bring them down. At that fortress, the Sentinels usher the now-awakened Dr. Trask into the Master Chamber and spot the X-Men arriving by car, making ready their defenses for a fight. When the X-Men arrive, they're all rather confused. All there is to see is an empty field. That is, until a muffled mechanical sound is heard and the fortress rises up from the earth itself on gigantic pistons and begins to open fire. At the time, readers were left on a cliffhanger. We don't have to be. We get to move right on to our next issue, X-Men number 15 from October of 1965. Written by Stan Lee, layouts by Jack Kirby, penciled by Werner Roth, inks by Dick Ayers, and letters by Artie Simak. Thank goodness we're not in 1965 and we don't have to wait for the next issue of X-Men. Poor Professor Rex has a migraine. Ah, that's so sad for him. His hands are fucking huge. Yeah. <laughs> so the attack by the Sentinels headquarters continues, and we see the X-Men in disarray as the Earth itself seems to be warping and shifting beneath them. As the Earth continues to crack and open, the X-Men make for higher ground, with Angel scooping up the Professor and the rest making their way up to safety, slowly but surely. Though not without Hank, of course, saying some weird shit to Jean. Tut tut, deputy leader, have you no regard for chivalry? I merely pause to offer assistance to yon damsel in distress. I'm hardly a damsel in distress, Mr. McCoy. If you'll kindly step aside, I shall levitate myself out of danger telekinetically. Or have you forgotten why I'm called Marble Girl? Ah, how I long for the olden days when maidens fainted at the drop of a hat. Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that ever happened. No. Also, you levitating yourself is new. Why would this have anything to do with why you're called Marble Girl? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, being called Marvel Girl has nothing to do with her powers. It's just like... A bad name. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad name that calls back to the publisher, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So once they're finally safe, we learn that what was happening was the Sentinels headquarters had been blasting out nature activator rays. Sure. I guess. But that still leaves them far from where they want to be as they have to stop the Sentinels. At the Professor's order, Bobby builds a giant ice glider. You know, the natural aerodynamic capabilities of a giant disc of ice. You know how light ice is. Not heavy at all. So the plan is for Hank and Bobby to climb aboard the glider and Scott to blast them across the chasm. Now this part of things goes to plan. But we're going to circle back to the inherently flawed element of this plan, being that a disc of ice was always a terrible idea as a glider. Shortly after blasting off, they begin to wobble, as the disc isn't aerodynamically sound. Which, to be fair, Bobby is a teenage superhero, not an engineer. I'm honestly just glad that they acknowledged this within the narrative, instead of accepting this as what was happening. <laughs> Yeah. Like, Stan didn't approach the situation thinking that this would work. <laughs> <laughs> they start to unbalance and wobble, and Warren swoops in to try to save the pair, but before he gets the chance, giant metal tentacles reach out of the base and snare both Beast and Iceman, pulling them inside the fortress. Angel attempts to follow, but is urged to report back what happened to the rest, and a good thing, too, is he's nearly charbroiled by a jet of flame issuing out of the opening. Iceman and Beast are then deposited in some kind of transparent prison, sealed in, and the cage is pumped full of sleeping gas. The Sentinels congratulate themselves for a job well done, certain that anyone else who tries to attack will meet with the same fate, much to the dismay of the still-imprisoned Boulevard Trask. He wanted to be able to subjugate others, not to be subjugated himself. That's not fair! His face turns red. Does. Except he doesn't look angry, he looks distraught. He does. I don't think the, the colorist was on the same page here. What page was he on? Page eight. <laughs> oh, that was a stupid joke. <laughs> <laughs> you said exactly what I wanted you to say, though. <laughs> Still, he's realizing that he's created a monster as the Sentinels cart him off to the Master Mold, the only one that can create more Sentinels. The Master Mold is a giant sentinel that Trask created, and he has the ability to build more sentinels, but apparently Trask did not grant him the knowledge. Uh... I don't know how that works. 
Why? Didn't he have the knowledge the first time he built them? Or was it wiped from his system and needs to be reintroduced? Uh, uh, more than that, why is this his plan to make the robots is to build <laughs> a giant robot to make the robots? He knows how to make the robots so he can just make them. I don't This is such an unnecessary know. contrivance. <laughs> I don't know how the logistics of this whole situation work. I don't know why he chose to do that. Well, he's an anthropologist, so <laughs> he doesn't know anything about sound mechanics. Clearly, we've already seen this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, his robots immediately turned on him. <laughs> so not only is he a bad engineer, he's a shit programmer. Yes. <laughs> I'm probably a shitty anthropologist, just judging from everything before this. <laughs> Boulevard Trask. Big fucking failure. <laughs> so the Master Mold orders Trask to give him that knowledge. Dr. Trask refuses, seeing it as a betrayal of all mankind. To which Master Mold threatens to unleash the weapons that Trask put in the Sentinel's hands, unleashing them on mankind, which leaves Trask utterly stunned. In desperation, he finds hope that the X-Men will defeat them, but Master Mold doesn't see this as much of a threat, given that they've already captured two of them. Fucking bold of you to assume that the X-Men are gonna save you when you literally created these robots to destroy the X-Men. No fucking shit. But I never thought that the leopards eating your face party would eat my face. Oh my god, that's a great example of leopards eating fishes. <laughs> <laughs> so Master Mold says he plans to study his captured X-Men before he destroys them. Outside, Angel returns to the remaining X-Men gathered together and coming up with a new plan. Charles plans to unleash a bolt of mental energy on the Sentinels operating the Fortress's weapons, hopefully allowing the X-Men to gain entry. He puts his plan into motion and inside the gunnery Sentinels collapse. It's really funny to me that they groan and grunt like it's not something you would expect from robots. No. <laughs> like malfunction or something. Yeah. Bzz, sure. Ooh, uh, ooh. Not ooh. so much. <laughs> Though other Sentinels make to contact their leader to replace the down gunners, this will take time. Which again seems dumb to me. They have to walk over and talk to the other robot. They can't radio over. Dr. Trask, among other things, as we mentioned earlier, is a shit programmer because they won't violate their programmed instructions. So the only way to do this is to walk over to the leader. Yeah. I also like that they all have numbers and letters on them. I don't know why the gunnery sentinels. I guess they all get letters. Everyone else gets numbers. Yeah. I like how number one has a special outfit. He does. <laughs> What's the point in being the big guy if you don't get a special outfit? He's not the big guy. The Master Mold is the big guy. Number one is actually number two. <laughs> <laughs> it's like first floor versus ground floor. Elsewhere, more sentinels carry the beast to the Master Mold's chamber where he prepares to study him. They bring him to a psychoprobe meant to get the beast talking, hoping to get to the bottom of what causes mutations and learn more about the X-Men. Yet again, Trask is the one doing this, with Master Mold threatening to obliterate a new nearby city should he disobey. As Hank explains that the mission of the X-Men is to protect mankind, Trask finally sees the errors of his ways, but seemingly too late. Outside, Angel, Cyclops, and Marvel Girl take advantage of the weapons outage to enter the fortress. It's really funny to me that unlike any other time Warren has flown someone, Scott is riding on his back like he's on a horseback ride. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> also, I don't think his wings would work that way. I don't think they would. He is not big enough to ride. But I still adore it. It is fun. <laughs> Scott blasts one of the guns in the porch to make an entryway for them, and the three teens enter. Looking around, they encounter a sentinel who hadn't been expecting other humans in the fortress. Unsure of what to do, he orders them to follow him to the head sentinel, and the X-Men follow along in the thought that it's the leader they need to take down. Still, this seems like a bad choice, but neither Scott nor the Professor thinks so. Back with the Master Mold, the Beast starts explaining his origin story. I really like this trope that X-Men will just start explaining their origin stories when there's other shit to do. And the Master Mold's like, 
well, there's other shit to do, but I have to listen to this teenage boy tell me his origin story. Wait, this is actually really interesting. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me more about it. (laughs) Yes, yes, the subjugation of all humankind. Tell me more about this. (laughs) Tell me about your father. How did you feel about him? (laughs) Well, Hank's father worked at an atomic project. And again, we're back on this implication that mutation was due to radiation. This Mm. eventually goes away, but we're not there yet. We also learn that as a child, Hank was bullied for physical differences that had to do with his mutation. And one day while dealing with a neighborhood bully, he was punched and knocked back into traffic. But with his natural ability, he was able to dodge the car that would have otherwise flattened him. And he finally realized that he wasn't quite like the other children, though the difference left him even lonelier than before. Now, the Sentinels that initially took off after the gunnery specialists went down finally report the failure to number one, setting the base more on edge for another assault, and interrupting Hank's story because they're rude like that. If you're going to interrogate the man, at least listen to his story. God. Meanwhile... Still following the sentinel they encountered on their entry, the rest of the X-Men spot the unconscious Bobby Drake and finally decide to stop cooperating. Warren and Jean fight the sentinel while Scott frees Bobby. As Iceman comes to, they begin to explain the situation to him. But midway through, alarm bells begin clanging. The fortress is on alert. Back in the master chamber, the master mold continues listening to Beast's tale. With his natural intelligence and his extra-natural agility and strength, Hank continued through the years becoming a local football star. This even earned him a scholarship to college. So assumedly Hank is the oldest of the bunch. We don't really know the orders of the others, but Bobby is the youngest and Hank is the oldest. Hank recalls how he got a bit carried away at the conference championship, kicking off his shoes and hanging off the goalpost. You know, as one does. As one does in a football game. (laughs) Everyone considered this touchdown celebration to be a bit much. Yeah? (laughs) And the newspapers reported on it, catching the attention of one Charles Xavier, who came to the McCoy household, offering to take him in and teach him. Side note, I love how supportive Mama and Papa McCoy are. He may seem strange to others, but he's a good boy, do you hear? And we're terribly proud of Henry, despite other people calling him a freak. That's very sweet. I like that. It really is. I think it's adorable. Speaking of the devil, outside, Charles Xavier begins to get wise to what's going on and is suddenly quite alarmed that Hank is telling far too much under the psychoprobe's compulsion. He projects his psyche into the fortress to try to make Hank stop talking, and just in the nick of time, too. After all, the Master Mold's new focus was going to be on who this mutant leader Hank was talking about was, And Charles Xavier sees himself as all-important, so we can't have Hank spilling the beans on that detail. Obviously, that's more important than Hank's identity and the identity of his parents and the place where he came from. That stuff doesn't matter if they know that, clearly. No, it only matters when it comes around to him. With Hank silent, Charles decides that he must take the risk to probe the Master Mold's mechanical mind. Try saying that one three times fast. Master Mold mechanical mind, Master Mold mechanical mind, Master Mold mechanical mind. You didn't say Master Mold's mechanical mind. I did, I said Master Mold. You said Master Mold, not Master Mold's. Fuck you. (laughs) Master Mold senses this attack, though, and blasts electric bolts throughout the chamber. They're hitting Charles' mental projection, disrupting him and he flees back towards his body before he's completely disrupted and assumedly killed. He is truly struggling the last few feet, and we're left in suspense as to if he actually makes it, as we're turned instead to the base sentinels closing in on the X-Men. Bobby builds a real monster of an ice wall, but it doesn't hold the sentinels back for long. One of the sentinels blasts through the wall with his own body. Cyclops manages to take that one down, but now they have no protection for the rest, one of whom activates a gravity ray and pulls the lot of them down to the ground, leaving them helpless. Master Mold orders Trask to build an army of thousands of sentinels, and things seem fairly hopeless. Yet again, we're left on a cliffhanger because this baby is a three-parter. Our first three-parter, in fact. What? They can do that? They can do that. Part 3 being X-Men number 16 from November of 1965. Written by Stan Lee, layouts by Jack Kirby, penciled by Warner Roth, inks by Dick Ayers, and letters by Artie Simak. So we return in this issue to an opening page that doesn't do a whole lot other than establish this central conflict. 
The Mutants and the Master Mold. We turn the page to resolve one of our dangling cliffhangers, and there we find that Charles Xavier's astral form indeed managed to find its way back to his body after all. Still, he lays mostly helpless on the grass across a chasm from his X-Men who desperately need his help, unable to do a whole lot about it. He muses about how Trask's well-intentioned bigotry led them to this point as he watches the fortress sink back down into the ground. And then he finally sets to work to help his X-Men in the only way he knows how. Painstakingly, he drags his body back to the road, flagging down a passing motorist so they can bring him back to the city to examine the fallen Sentinel back at the TV studio. Back in the Sentinel's fortress, they carry the captured X-Men in some kind of high-gravity globe that increases the gravity to keep them helpless like they were at the time of their capture. They try their best to break the globe, but even minutes of sustained optic blasts don't do the trick. Jean's telekinesis doesn't work. Even Bobby's attempt to break it by pressure from an ever-expanding bar of ice only shatters the ice. They then decide to bide their time and wait until the Sentinels attempt to take another one of them to strike. The Master Mold has finally finished examining the beast. A bevy of Sentinels carry him off to leave with the others until they're ready to get rid of the lot. But Dr. Trash protests again that his bigotry and his fear was wrong. Master Mold does not hold a pair of sympathetic ears for his argument. I think the Sentinels are a great case for their unforeseen consequences of bigotry. Even if you change your mind, it doesn't change the chain of events that your hate may have unleashed. Yeah, I agree. That's a pretty good assessment of it. At another threat to the nearby city, assumedly New York, Boulevard Trask gives in, agreeing to help build the army of Sentinels no matter how much he hates the idea. Having bummed a ride from the motorist, Charles arrives back in the studio to examine the fallen sentinel. The authorities are already giving it a look over, but they cannot make hide nor hair of the robot either. Charles focuses his energy on the machine, figuring out that it requires a signal to operate and something interfered with the signal. He then realizes that it is a giant crystal perched atop a tower attached to a nearby crystal products building. Why is a great question. To advertise what they do? How expensive was that big-ass rock just to put on top of your place for display purposes? Crystal products? So, like, a New Age witchy store? (laughs) That wasn't what I had in mind. (laughs) I thought something for manufacturing purposes, but you know what? It's probably true. (laughs) This is feng shui store (laughs) manufacturing. Yeah. You go inside and there's just a bunch of crystals on strings. That's where you get all your shitty rocks that they say are magic (laughs) sorry for the hot take if anyone out there believes in magic rocks it's not magic it's science that other science doesn't support for some reason yeah clearly also absurd is that chuck is reading the robot's mind and is able to discern that it's the giant crystal that caused the problem but you know while the other sentinels carry beast back to the heavy gravity globe to deposit him with his comrades And the X-Men realize that at last their time has come. As a portal within the structure of the globe opens, Scott waits for the right moment and blasts outward, taking out the Sentinel carrying Hank and leaving the rest to bumble into one another. They attempt to close the globe, but the X-Men escape, and then Scott blasts the controls to prevent anything else from getting in their way. So that only leaves, like, an ass load of Sentinels, right? Or are they just permanently broken once they fall down? With teamwork, they manage to beat enough of them to try and make a getaway before they're again felled by stun rays. The Sentinels close in, ready to slay the X-Men before they can cause any more trouble, and then collapse on large. We cut to a formation of three helicopters carrying the giant crystal suspended between them. I don't think three helicopters would be enough to lift that monster. No. (laughs) But I digress. Apparently the cops arranged this after someone from Washington ordered them to listen to what Xavier said. I have to wonder whether this is real or fake. He does have some contacts in Washington, like Fred Duncan with the FBI. But maybe you haven't noticed how problems Charles Xavier have just seem to sort themselves out. You gotta wonder, did he just tell the cops someone from Washington said it's okay? Yeah, probably. (laughs) While the fortress begins emerging from the earth to target the helicopters... 
but as they continue their travel at Xavier's insistence, the Sentinels operating the guns are also shut down. Now, I think it's worth noting that this is another case of Stanley's science, because this seems to imply that once the Sentinel's reception is impaired, they're forever downed. But since the crystal isn't there, shouldn't there be a lone Sentinel back at the TV studio on a rampage? Wait, so the implication is the crystal being there interferes with them? I don't... It's see, not that's what... the problem, because... That's another problem, because the transmission is assumedly coming from inside the base, and it was the crystal impairing the reception that fucked with the one sentinel, right? So right. assumedly this crystal being there shouldn't fuck with them, because they should be getting their transmission from inside the house. Yeah? But that doesn't matter. It works. Yeah, comic <laughs> books, it works. There's never all that Don't much time it. to focus on how wrong stand science is or we'd be here all day. I know. <laughs> You'll drive yourself mad. <laughs> you will. Inside, the X-Men move to close in on the Master Mold, Warren impetuously leading the charge as ever, even as his friends urge him to wait for them. Suddenly, the lights go dark, and the vibration of some great machinery fills the fortress. The Master Mold has begun construction. With the threat of the city being destroyed, Trash can only watch as the Sentinels begin construction, despite how troubled he is about the future of mankind should they do so. He cannot bear it, and finally finds the strength to stand against the Master Mold, shattering the power source for the machinery and the Master Mold himself. With a mighty explosion, both Trask and his machines are destroyed, and the X-Men have only to flee before the whole fortress is consumed. Though, it's been a while since we've checked in on the love triangle. There's an absurd bit while they sit there and debate how to get Angel, Scott, and Jean on the other side of a wall of flames. Now, to me, the logical conclusion would be Angel flies Scott, Jean levitates herself. To the X-Men, it is apparently Jean levitates Scott, swooning all the while about how he worries about her, and Warren carries Jean over the flames, with Jean helping with her telekinesis anyway, so why didn't she just fly? It's a silly excuse to get into love triangle bullshit. The back of her head looks like she has pigtails. It does kind of look like she has pigtails. That would be a nice, kind of a nice, a better explanation than just loose Yeah, hair. two little holes. Yeah. Okay. I can accept that. I don't love it, but I can deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> More superheroes should have pigtails. Anyway, it's a silly excuse to get into the love triangle bullshit, but the X-Men make it outside. And Charles also needlessly mind wipes the cops. Of course he does. <laughs> why should anyone know the X-Men were involved? I mean, why shouldn't they know? Does it matter? With that said, we end our story. Boulevard Trask and his sentinels having paid the price of his hatred, the X-Men safe and sound, the world protected. Ominous shadow on the wall of the X-Mansion. <gasps> the end. <laughs> wow, I have chills. Let's talk about what we read. What did you think? I know you enjoyed the juggernaut. What did you think about the Sentinel story? What did I think of the issues today? I didn't hate it, but I also didn't love it for a variety of reasons. I thought the plot and the basic premise was kind of very standard. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a lot of, you know, sci-fi horror films with that exact same premise out there. So it wasn't super original, but I do like, you know, the whole thing about Trask's own bigotry being his undoing, basically. I do like that, yeah. I really enjoy that. I think that this story is hampered by a lot of inconsistencies. Like, Charles can... Mentally affect robots, except no, he can't. Except, oh, he can again. Only when it's convenient. Yeah. As comic laws dictate. And the crystal, similarly. And the robots that, for plot convenience reasons, need to walk to go talk to their supervisor. I think that the robots just did not vibe with that particular crystal. <laughs> <laughs> because of crystal rock magic, right? That's, that's it. The crystal had bad vibes. It had bad vibes. <laughs> the bad vibes killed the robots. Rancid vibes. <laughs> Absolutely tossed. Maybe those were just Charles's vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Xavier's toxic vibes killed the Sentinels. I believe it. He's a toxic individual. He is. <laughs> You know, it's really important to not tolerate toxic people in your life. So instead, just die. <laughs> yes. 
Charles really is a whole lot. Why did he mind wipe the cops? Like, is this not a... Well, I guess I can see the argument that a lot of people were going to be on Trask's side. And if Trask died because the X and the X-Men were seen fleeing the scene, that's not a great look. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that until just now. Because... Nobody else knows, outside of the X-Men, maybe, that they were going to conquer the world, right? Yeah, they didn't. I mean... They did say some shit at the TV studio. They did say that, uh, like, on TV, actually. Okay, so... So people know. So it's not a terrible look if the X-Men come make a mess of this. Yeah. You would think people would be like, oh, the X-Men... Did a good. ...stopped the Sentinels from taking over the world. I guess it depends on how much of a bigot you are. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So how much of a dick is this guy so far? A lot. He's the fucking worst. Despite how angry the Juggernaut was, I don't think the Juggernaut was that unjustified for his anger at his stepbrother. And he doesn't treat them all that well. He puts up with the boys saying a lot of sexist shit to Jean, and, oh, I'm glad you cooked because the chef took the day off, and you get to play nurse to all the boys. And I mean, I know that's mostly Stan and not actually Charles, but that's not how it looks if you just read it. (laughs) He allows that. He puts a lot of pressure on Scott without a whole lot of the affection that he desperately needs. While thinking that Scott has too much pressure, that is too stressed out and lonely. Yes. Like, you were the one who's contributing most to this. You did this, Charles. This was you. (laughs) He mind-wiped the torch for no fucking reason when he was coming to help. I don't know why that one really bothers me. I get it. Out of all the shit he's done, that really perturbs me. (laughs) Oh, he pretended he was grievously injured and let his students worry about him. (laughs) <laughs> he left them alone and then made them travel to Europe to help him kill a guy. <laughs> he caused that entire fight with the Avengers for no fucking reason. Yeah. This is now a podcast that just lists Charles Xavier's crimes. This has secretly been a Charles Xavier hate podcast this entire time. Yeah. We go through X-Men stories, but really we're just looking for Charles Xavier's flaws to point them out. Yeah, and then the Thor issues are to throw you off. (laughs) Throw you off the sense. Now we've thrown you off your rhythm. I mean, to be fair, Odin kind of gets that way too. Like, we haven't seen it a lot at this point, but you start to get an inkling of it with him telling Thor that he cannot be with the girl he loves. Right, being super controlling about this situation with Jane. Being kind of a dick about Loki. Yeah. We don't see all that much of it because these issues are so short. Mm -hmm. I feel like is a big part of why we don't see so much of Odin being a dick. We also haven't really seen that much of Odin at all yet. Yes. Comparatively, the amount of his presence versus the amount of dickishness is fairly high. Yes. The more he's there, the worse he will get. That entirely makes sense. We see so much of Charles being a dick because he's here every issue. Stan's got a weird thing about paternal figures. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but these two are pretty good examples of the trend where this father knows best thing is taken at face value all while outlying the flaws in that. Yeah. Well, that's going to be it for us this week. This was a little bit of a short one. Next week, we are going to be back with Thor. If you have any feedback you'd like to send us, shoot us an email over at comexplaining at gmail.com. I like your smooth jazz voice. Thank you. (laughs) You can also reach us over on Tumblr, Twitter, or Facebook. We are comexplaining on all of those locations. If you'd like to support the show, consider donating to us on Patreon. Same name. We got the same name pretty much everywhere. Yeah, we were lucky that way. (laughs) We were. It was planned. (laughs) (laughs) I worked hard for it. You did. (laughs) You work hard for the money. 
so hard for it, honey. <laughs> I work hard for the money, so you better treat me right. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> If you'd like to rate and review us on iTunes or Podchaser, that would be absolutely spectacular. If you'd like to join us at Marvel Puzzle Quest, you can join our alliance. That is 61FIX, the number 6, the number 1, the word fix as in fixing your car. We play regularly, and we would love to have more people for team events. Also, check out my webcomic. It's on tapis.io slash series slash ephemeris, E-P-H-E-M-E-R-I-S. And also, catch me playing D&D every Sunday at 7 EST on twitch.tv slash droptune. All right, then we will talk to you next week with Thor. We look forward to talking to you then. Bye. Bye.